This is what Jesus said of Satan. He said, he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Wherever you find something that's not true, it came from Satan. Non-truth is Satan inspired. In the core passage that was the basis for this series of messages, which is Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible tells us that we're to stand having girded our waist with the truth. It seems strange that the belt of the armor, which is in Ephesians 6, is the first item that Paul mentions. He says, wrap yourself around with the belt of truth. It wasn't a piece of armor. I mean, a a belt's not going to keep you from being wounded. But the belt had a central function that was vital to the soldier's armor. The soldier had all of this equipment that he wore, and he had a shirt that draped from his shoulders to his knees. And the Roman soldier wore a metal torso armor that was long and protective with leather strips that hung from his waist to his lower thighs around his whole body. Very cumbersome. But his belt was a band of wide, thick leather with loops and slots that clamped over these items. And from this belt, there was a sword that hung and a rope and a ration sack and money and darts. Everything the soldier needed in hand-to-hand combat was on his belt right there at his fingertips. But when the soldier had to run, he would pull his tunic up, which was down around his legs, and he would pull it up and he would tuck it in that belt and free his legs for speed and maneuverability. And when you read about it in the Bible, here's what it's called, girding one's loins. That's what that means. It means to pull your clothes up and tuck them in your belt so you can move rapidly. Now the belt didn't have any offensive function of its own. It was a piece of equipment that essentially held everything else together, keeping the soldier ready for anything that he might face. And here's what that means for us today in our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, truth holds everything together. Truth makes us ready. At the center of our lives, we place the truth in Jesus, and everything we do is drawn from that all-encompassing center. Listen to me. If we don't have the truth, we don't have anything. Without the truth, we are empty. We have nothing to offer the world. We have nothing to give anyone if we do not have the truth. But when we know the truth and we live the truth, we can assess our weapons quickly and confidently, and we don't have to fear anything being out of place in our lives. How many of you know how much better and simpler it is to just live in the truth? Have you ever caught yourself living in something that's not true and you're always looking over your shoulder to see if somebody knows what the truth is? And when you don't tell the truth, you have to tell another lie to cover up the lie you told and it just weaves itself around you until it just debilitates you. I just love it. Truth is simple. You know, it's just tell the truth and always tell the truth. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2 says this. We have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Truth gives us the courage to stand against our enemy. Why is truth to be our primary concern? Because the weapons of Satan are the exact opposite. Do you know what Satan's weapons are? Here they are. They're falsehood and deception. Satan wants to deceive you, He wants to destroy you. He wants to take your influence away in this world. And what he works against is the truth of God in your life. John 8, 44 says of Satan, when he speaks a lie, listen to this, he speaks from his own resources, for Satan is a liar and the father of lies. Lies come from the enemy. If you've caught yourself in this little innocent lie, let me tell you, it didn't come from God. It came from Satan. Satan is the author of all falsehood. Falsehood does not come from God. And when we stand in the truth, we never speak from ourselves. We speak from the truth revealed to us through the Bible and the Holy Spirit. Speaking truth is not always comfortable. How many of you know it's always right? Almost 2,000 years ago, a Roman governor asked a profound and familiar question of a man who was about to be executed. He said to him, what is truth? We have no way of knowing whether Pilate's question was a serious question or just sarcastic. 
But we do know that minutes later, he turned Jesus over to an angry crowd to be crucified. Isn't it interesting? Pilate judged the truth. He sentenced the truth. He scourged the truth. He mocked the truth. He crucified the truth. When he asked Jesus, what is truth? Truth was standing right in front of him. Jesus Christ was the truth. The irony is at the very moment he asked this question, he was staring at the pure incarnation of truth. The one who is the truth had just said to him, everyone who hears me, he is of the truth. And you know what? Ever since Pilate asked that question, what is truth? Everybody's been asking that question, haven't they? What is truth? And today, truth is up for grabs. According to Oz Guinness, truth in any objective or absolute sense, truth that is independent of the mind of the knower, no longer exists. A simple way to illustrate what's happened to truth lies in the story I read about three baseball umpires who were debating their different style of umpiring. One of them said, there's balls and there's strikes, and I call them the way they are. No, said the second umpire, that's arrogant. There's balls and there's strikes, and I call them the way I see them. That's no better, said the third umpire. Why beat around the bush? Why not be realistic about what we do? There's balls and there's strikes, and they ain't nothing till we call them. <laughs> now watch this. The first umpire represents the traditional view of truth. Objective, independent of the mind and of the knower, there to be discovered as it is. What did he say? We call balls and strikes as they are. The second speaks for moderate relativism, truth as each person sees it. Here people say, well, I don't see that as true. You see it as true, but I see that as false. So everybody has their own truth. Can I get a witness? <laughs> and the third umpire bluntly expresses the radical relativist, the postmodern position Truth is not to be discovered. It's for each of us to create for ourselves. According to the relativist position, all of us, we, we just get to create our own truth. There is no such thing as objective truth. What's true for you is not true for me. I get to have my truth and you get to have your truth. As if there is no real truth. In the final analysis, truth corresponds to the first umpire's position. To what actually is. And that's why truth is found in God. God is the great I am. He is the truth. Do you know when the Bible says, in the beginning, God, that's the answer to everything. Because God is the ultimate reality. So what is true? It's God is true. In the beginning, God was. He is the self-existent one. He's the creator of everything that exists. God is truth, and all truth is God's truth. In the Bible, he is called the God of truth. The Father, the first person of the Trinity, is truth. Psalm 31, 5 says, Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. And you know Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity. How should we be surprised to discover that Jesus Christ is truth as well? The Bible says, Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. And because he is full of grace and truth, he can say, I am the way the truth and the life. The Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ is the communicator of truth. He's the witness to the truth. He's the origin of the truth. He's the preacher of the truth. He is truth embodied. Truth is not some system or philosophy. Truth is a person. If you want to know the truth of God, you must come to know Jesus Christ because he alone is truth. That's why the Bible says Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. Why? You can't get to the Father unless you come through truth. And not only is God the Father truth and God the Son truth, don't be surprised, God the Holy Spirit is truth as well. We read, when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. The next time somebody talks to you about their truth, well, this is my truth. Don't get caught up in that discussion. There's only one truth, and it's the truth of God. When we get connected with God, we're in his truth. But if we're anything else, we're in error and falsehood. There is not many divisions or, or versions of truth. There's only one truth. And God himself is that truth. 
So if that's the case, and we want to overcome falsehood with truth, how do we do that? I want to give you some thoughts about how we go about overcoming falsehood with truth. First of all, we overcome falsehood with truth by seeking the truth ourselves. To do battle with the enemy, the believer needs to know the truth about God, the truth about Christ, and the truth that is in this book we call the Bible. There's two things we can take out of this that we just do. First of all, we need to study the truth. You know what, folks? I've grown up in a culture of ministers who minimize the truth of the Word of God. If you can get five or six sentences that come from the Bible in some of their messages, you've had a lucky day. <laughs> People don't take their Bibles to church because they say, oh, you don't need all that Bible stuff. Well, if you don't need all that Bible stuff, why are you a pastor? Why are you a minister? If you don't need the Bible, what purpose do you have? You see, the truth is so critical because we have nothing else. Our whole life is based upon the truth of God. And it's a shame to me that so many believers don't understand that. Uh, if you come to Shadow Mountain Community Church, you're going to hear a message from the Bible. Uh, I don't, I'm not a motivator. Uh, I hope I'm motivational in what I say from the Bible, but I'm not a motivator. It's not what I do. I'm not a, a public relations artist. I'm a preacher of the Word of God. So, so listen, listen, you guys. We need not to be ashamed that we study the truth. There's no premium on ignorance in the Christian life. You can't go around and brag about how much you don't know about the Bible. So in order to overcome falsehood with truth, you have to study the truth. And the truth is written in the scripture. It's systemized truth. I urge you to answer for yourself this question that a friend of mine by the name of Stu Weber asks. Are you involved in a regular, rigorous regimen of Bible study? If not, what in the world are you doing? Your mind, your most critical weapon in battle, is braced by doctrine. Your soul is strengthened by biblical knowledge. If God's people will make the knowledge of God and his word the pursuit of their lives, Satan gets discouraged and defeated when he comes to divide and deceive and destroy. To seek the truth, you must diligently search the scriptures. That's why we put Bible teaching on the radio, Bible teaching on television, and on the internet, and in books. Because the truth of God is what protects us. It's what gives us hope for the future. With all this stuff floating around, and fake news, and all the other stuff that's happening. I know the truth. The truth is my blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So you study the truth, and not only do you study it, you have to submit to the truth. Counterfeit truth is never more on display than in the way we often hear people speak of God in today's world. Listen to this. You've heard it before. My God wants me to be rich. The God I believe in, he'd never send anybody to hell. How dare your God claim to be the only one in heaven? When somebody says to me, my God would never do that, I tell them you're absolutely right because your God doesn't exist. You know, your God doesn't exist. You know why? You don't get to make your God to be who you want him to be. If you want to live immoral lives, you can't just say, well, my God's okay with that. No, he's not because you don't have a God. Your, your God is somebody in your, in your imagination. God is who he is. We don't get to change him. His purpose is to change us. We don't get to change him. We live in this crazy time. And unfortunately in this time, there's this form of lying that is used by some people to justify not telling the truth. It's called spin. Spin is the recasting, reinterpretation, revision of the truth to make it more palatable. The point is not to be truthful. It's to reinterpret facts, to take the edge off of the truth and make it more politically correct and less offensive for your own goals. But in God's sight, spin is lying. You don't get to say, okay, well, it was 90% of the truth, so it's the truth. It's either 100% true or it's a lie. You know, 
Here's what the Bible says about God in Proverbs 6. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Now listen to this. A proud heart, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to running to evil. Here's another. A false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among the brethren. Let me just say it out loud. The Bible says God hates lying. Proverbs 12, 22 says, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. Our words, men and women as Christians that are spoken or written, cannot be taken back. Once you tell a lie, it's out there. It has its own life, and even if the effects can be stopped or reversed, the reputation of the liar is forever damaged. Instead of lying, the overcomer has to learn how to speak the truth. How do we overcome falsehood with with truth? We start with ourselves. We start speaking the truth. We stop coloring the truth. We stop making up things that make us look better when it's not the way it is. We just tell the truth. It's such a freeing thing to be people of truth. And God has called us to speak the truth. That's the first thing. Number two. We not only have to speak the truth, but the Bible says we have to speak it lovingly. You know, have you ever told, have you ever been around people that say, well, I just, I just tell people the way it is. <laughs> then they vitiate you for three hours and it takes you a couple weeks to get over it. The Bible does say we're to speak the truth boldly, but we're also to speak it with love. The Bible says we're to speak the truth with grace. I heard about a fourth grade teacher who was recovering from surgery and got a get well card from her class. It read, Dear Mrs. Fisher, your fourth grade class wishes you a speedy recovery by a vote of 15 to 14. (laughs) I don't know if that story is true or not, (laughs) but that's not truth and love, is it? (laughs) Jesus said, by this, everybody will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. We need to speak the truth, absolutely. But we need to speak it with love, don't we? Jesus modeled that for us. Jesus was full of grace and truth. So that's how we should be as well. So we overcome falsehood by seeking the truth and by speaking the truth. And thirdly, we overcome falsehood by living the truth. The overcomer has to be clothed with truthfulness, integrated into his or her own life. Listen to the words of the Apostle John. He said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. God wants us to walk in. He doesn't want us just to study the truth. He doesn't want us just to speak the truth. He wants us to live in truth. Be true to ourselves. Be true to God. You know, every once in a while you read stories of people who live double lives. You know, somebody got two wives and they're scattered all over the country. They live in two lives. How in the world could you ever allow that to happen in your life? And how could you ever survive it? Truth is the integrating center of who we are in God. And we're to live the truth. You know, the Lord illustrated that for us in such a perfect way. Listen to this. When his enemies came to arrest him, he said to them, which of you convicts me of sin? Nobody said a word. Do you know why? (laughs) Because they didn't have anything they could say. (laughs) They had nothing legitimate to convict him of because he was absolutely everything he claimed to be. Jesus went to the cross. The centurion overseeing the execution said, truly, this man was the son of God. How did he figure that out? He simply watched Jesus die as Jesus had lived. He saw that Jesus was who he claimed to be exhibiting attributes that only the Son of God could possess. And the thief who hung on the cross next to Jesus, remember what he said? This man has done nothing wrong. Why would he say that? Because he saw the truth exhibited in Christ, even under the stress of horrendous circumstances. Men and women, what's killing the impact of the church today is men and women who are in the church who aren't living the faith. They live two lives. They have their church life, their religious life, and then they have the life that they live in the world. And the world sees that. The world's not stupid. The world sees the 
inaccuracy and the lack of integrity in our lives, why would they want that? They got that without Jesus. They don't need Jesus for that. So if we're going to change this whole issue of falsehood taking center stage instead of truth, we have to seek the truth. We have to speak the truth. But most of all, we have to live the truth. We have to be who we are all the way through to the core. And God is allowing that to happen. And, and a lot of churches that I know about now are starting to have some kind of revivals that are bringing that about through prayer and sometimes through fasting. We're getting back to who we should be. And when, when the church of God is who it should be, there's nothing that can stand against it. You know, I wonder what would happen if we had that spirit of truth about our churches. What difference that would make. And I just want to urge you guys, let's be a part of that something, that good something, that true something. Let's, let's shun the falsehood that's running around trying to destroy us, and let's get back to the truth. You say, well, where do I find that truth? The Word of God is truth. And you know what the Bible says? The truth will set you free. It'll set you free. Amen? It'll set you free from looking over your shoulder to see who's following you or what you said the last time. The Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Let's be overcomers. Let's overcome falsehood with the truth. Let's tell people the truth about Jesus Christ. Let's turn up the volume. Amen. The message that he gives to us in this passage in 2 Peter is the message for this day. The importance of staying challenged and staying diligent in what we're doing, not only in life, but especially for Christ in these very uncertain days. You see, our tendency, men and women, is when we come to times like this is to just back down, to, to, uh, to chill out, if you will, and to say, when this is over, I'll get back to the business of living. But when we do that, we miss the opportunity that God has given us, not only to make a difference in the world where we live, but to make a difference in the world of our own life, to use the challenges to be challenged ourselves. And that's the message I want to share with you today. First of all, this word diligent, oh, it's an incredible word. It's a word that we don't talk about very much and we don't live very much either. But let me tell you what it's all about by beginning with this whole idea of the purpose of diligence. At the beginning of 2 Peter, in the first chapter of this book, we catch a glimpse of how diligence fits into Peter's overall theme. Listen to what he says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Peter offers two focal points in this passage. First, there is this astonishing idea that every follower of Jesus Christ has been given everything that he needs for life and godliness. Not some things, not even most things, but everything. Have you ever thought about the fact that as a Christian, you have everything you need? And the second focal point of Peter's message is to tell us where all of that is. This is all we need for life and godliness. These are the precious promises of the Word of God. Here in this book, we have God's wonderful gift to us. But Peter wants us to understand that once we get the gift, there's certain diligence that's demanded of us if we're going to realize the benefit of that which we have been given. Let me speak with you now about the prerequisite of diligence. Look again in your Bibles, and you will notice that in this section of Peter, there is a list, a list of seven things, things that we're to do, things we're to add. But notice the list begins with one word, and it's the word faith. Faith is always the prerequisite for our diligence. Peter begins right there, telling us in verse 5 what to add to our faith, and the list of add-ons follows, but the steam engine that pulls the whole train is faith. Without faith, we're going nowhere. So the prerequisite for your diligence in your Christian life is you must be a Christian. You must have faith. 
Faith is the beginning of the process. We accept Christ by faith. We are saved completely by God's grace. And we move forward from that point onward with due diligence to take what God has given us to the next level. So we have the purpose of diligence. What is it? To take the things that God has given us in his word and to use diligence to accomplish everything for which they were intended. And we have the prerequisite of diligence. You can't have the diligence of the Christian life if you don't have the Christian life. It begins with faith. Now notice thirdly the principles of diligence. It's time to understand the meaning of the word that I believe is the key to our Christian life. What does it mean to be diligent? Now so often as preachers what we do is we give people some high and lofty principle. We talk about how wonderful it is and we never tell them what it is. What does it mean to be diligent? So let me take the word apart. Let me go back to the to the the languages in which it was written and let me describe for you what I believe this word was meant to convey to our souls. First of all, diligence means in the language of the New Testament to strenuously give yourself to something. Strenuous is the key word and it's a it's a word that comes out of the realm of athletics. It is a demanding and sweat producing word if you will. It means to give all strenuous activity toward a goal. It comes from the athletic world of intense concentration on the goal of becoming a champion. Secondly, the word has another meaning. There's a secondary meaning to the word diligent, and that's the word lavish, to give yourself to something lavishly. Those two words, strenuous and lavish, combine together to help us understand what the word diligence means. So how do we apply that to our lives as Christians? It's almost so foreign from our actual practice that it's hard to make the application. Could you think for a moment of what would happen if you took all the precious promises, the exceedingly precious promises of this book, which God has given to you so that you can have everything you need for life and godliness, and you took all of those precious promises and with diligence you mined them. What is diligence? Strenuous lavish activity nothing is too hard nothing is requiring too much for you to learn the principles of the Word of God that's what diligence means now we have to take this little list that we find here in 2nd Peter and take it quickly and go through and examine what it says because Peter offers us seven priorities of diligence all of them are built upon the foundation called faith Like many biblical lists, this one isn't exhaustive. There are other things that could be added to it, but I believe these seven things are special. They kind of form a basic matrix that we can use to build our Christian lives. These are seven elements you should look for when you're checking up on yourself periodically. And I'm going to take them one at a time and add them as we go along. Notice, first of all, it says to your faith add virtue, 2 Peter 1, 5. Do you know what virtue is? Virtue is courage. This is the New Testament word for moral goodness. Having the courage to do the right thing no matter what the circumstances might dictate. People with strong integrity are consistent from one situation to another. They act from their moral base rather than from consensus or popular opinion. This kind of virtue develops as we become Diligent in the Word of God and begin to show the mind of Christ in our actions. Peter says, Add to your faith virtue, and then he says, And add to your virtue knowledge. This one means exactly what it says. It means we're to continue growing in the knowledge of God's Word. In fact, the word knowledge is found five times in the first chapter of 2 Peter. What we need is knowledge that's anchored in the truth, and we have it in the Scriptures. It only remains for us to extract that knowledge and make it part of all that we do. And then he says, add to your knowledge self-control. Now I have to tell you, everybody take a deep breath. We all don't like this word, self-control. We're okay with gaining knowledge. Uh, We we can deal with moral virtue, but self-control. This concept is a tough one. Yet if you study the Bible, you know it shows up a lot. It's in many of the key lists of the New Testament, self-control. And then Peter says, add to self-control perseverance. 
it sounds similar, but uh, perseverance is a glorified synonym for patience. It means to voluntarily and continually endure difficulties and hardship for the sake of honor. Perseverance is silencing your body when it begins to complain. <laughs> Perseverance is forcing yourself awake to study the Bible in the morning when you know you could use another 15 minutes of sleep. Perseverance is the trademark of every champion you have ever met. Now notice, to perseverance add godliness. Godliness is a word that means to have reverence and respect for God. We need real godliness all the time, but it is especially necessary in chaotic days like the ones we are currently experiencing. And when I say godliness, I'm not talking about the everyday kind of run-of-the-mill pattern that passes for godliness sometimes. Today, we seem to be presenting our concept of God in a more casual, user-friendly way, and I see some dangers there. We want unbelievers to see a positive faith, and that's good. We want them to see a God of love instead of one who is relentlessly angry, and that too is good. But I worry that bit by bit we're losing the concept of his holiness and his majestic infinite magnitude. Yes, even his judgment of our sin. Our God is an awesome God, a glorious king, and so much more than a grandfather in heaven, which is the way so many paint him these days. I bring this up because the godly Christian is the one who is truly humble before God. We need to stop and quit being a frivolous as we talk about the one who is our creator and is the giver of life to us all. That's what it means to be godly. It means to have a reverence for the God we serve. And then finally, uh, and I'm going to add these two together because they're very similar. Add to your godliness brotherly kindness and love. 2 Peter 1.7 says, To godliness we are to add brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness we are to add love. When we practice brotherly kindness and love, we are different than the people around us, and especially is that true now. Uh, I've noticed that as I look around in the culture today, as we're going through these chaotic times, there's a lot of selfishness and there's no looking around for the needs of others. That's exactly opposite from what we are instructed to do in this, in this book we call the Bible. We are to diligently add to our faith virtue. And at the end of our virtue is godliness and brotherly kindness and love. We're to be people who are known by the way we care about others. Let me come to the end of this discussion and make a couple of practical applications that are really important. I want to talk with you about the possibilities of diligence in your life. Peter offers us some pictures of what will happen if we determine by the grace of God and in the power of the Holy Spirit that we're going to be diligent in the way we live life. Here are three things that will happen to you if you do it. First of all, in 2 Peter 1.8 we read, For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, if you allow yourself to embrace the diligent life, you will have stability in the way you live. Peter wants us to know that if we pursue God and focus on these qualities, we will begin to see them come together in our lives. Character is the result of persistent action, and a pattern of diligence will lead to stability. But if you will be diligent in these days when you are tested, God will give you some spiritual muscles that will grow on your spiritual frame, and you will discover a kind of inner strength that will take you through things you never believed you could endure and, and give you the opportunity to help others along the way. You will have stability in your Christian life. Secondly, you will have vitality in your Christian life. Vitality is defined as abundant mental and physical energy. And then thirdly, you will have reality in your Christian life. Stability, vitality, and reality. Peter says that we will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus. That means we will know his truth deeply. And it will bear real fruit all around us. We'll be involved in the real world, connecting the truth of the gospel to the needs of the people that we see. Some people believe that faith is some kind of fantasy world where we escape the problems of the day. 
But Peter says when we have diligence in developing our walk with Christ, we will become more real than we've ever been before. We won't be escape artists. We will be embrace artists. We will embrace the problems of the world and bring the presence of Jesus right into the center of them, which is something we all dream about if we're true Christians. So there are three things that will happen to you if you determine to make diligence a part of your life. L let me give you three things that will happen to you if you don't. This is no easy in and out message. You don't just come and say, well, I think I'll do that. And if I don't do that, I'll still be the same. No, having heard these words, you cannot be the same because the Bible tells us that if you embrace diligence in your walk with Christ, here are some things that will happen. And in the same passage, he tells us that if we refuse to take the challenge and live our lives challenged by God's word, there are certain things we can expect to happen. Number one, we will lack spiritual power. Verse 9 of 2 Peter 1 says, For he who lacks these things. Peter speaks of life for those who lack the list he has just given. And he says there are millions of people who profess to be Christians and they manage to avoid going after virtue. They manage to avoid going after knowledge and self-control. And you have a reunion with them after 30 years and what you discover is they haven't changed at all. They're at the same level of spiritual immaturity as they were when you first knew them as Christians. Without a diligent walk with Christ, you will end up powerless in your, in your life as a Christian. Number two, you will lack spiritual perception. Interesting, 2 Peter 1.9 says they will be short-sighted even to blindness. Peter speaks of the immature Christian as so short-sighted that it's like he's blind. We live in an era in which keen eyes are essential spiritual equipment, and you realize what kind of sight I'm talking about. We have to be able to see truth as if looking through the eyes of God. There are so many things that swirl around us every day, so many different ways that we can be taken away from the path. We need to have discernment. We need to be able to see things as they really are. And the Bible says that when a person no longer has diligence, especially in the word of God, he loses his perception. He becomes an easy target for all of the false doctrines that flow around us in the world today. As we read the headlines and consider our own business and housing decisions and we try to figure out what to do, we need to pray, but we need to read the word of God and we need the strength that comes through a diligent walk with Jesus Christ. So if you decide you are not going to live a diligent life, you're just happy where you are and thank you very much, Pastor. I wish I hadn't listened to this message. If that's where you are, if, if you think, okay, I can just be happy where I am, I'm telling you where you're going. First of all, you will lack spiritual power and you will lose your sense of perception about life. And here's the third one. You will lose your spiritual privilege. You can never lose your salvation, but you can lose the joy of it. You can lose the sense of God's presence in your life. Listen to 2 Peter 1.9. And I'm going to read it and I want you to listen to it. And I want you to understand it means exactly what it says. Here's what Peter said. And in that moment, when you have no longer diligently followed Christ, you will have forgotten that you were cleansed from your old sins. Let me read that again. You will have forgotten that you have been cleansed from your old sins. Can you imagine experiencing the miracle of salvation, the cleansing of the blood of Christ, the arrival of the Holy Spirit, the joy of Christian fellowship, only to forget that that ever happened? Do you know that you can get so far away from God as a Christian, so far away from the instruction of his word, so lacking in diligence, so lacking in strenuous and lavish pursuit of the things of God that you wake up one day and you can hardly find any, any evidence in your own life. And then you come along and you say to the pastor, pastor, I, I, I don't know what's going on. I, am I really saved? How can I be sure? This is why, as a Christian, you want to develop a passionate, focused, diligent life, growing in the traits that Peter mentions. Everything we could possibly need to be difference makers in this world, once again, has been given to us. We don't need any more information. We don't need another revelation. We have it all. God has given it to us in between the covers of this, of this book. Now it's up to us to take what we have been given and give it back to God in the life of diligence that will bring honor to his name and strength to our lives. 
I've talked with you today about the purpose of diligence and the prerequisite of it, the principles of it, the priorities of it, the possibilities of it, and I want to finish with the promise of it. Have you got your Bible still open? Look down at 2 Peter 1, verse 10. Here's what it says. If you do these things, you will never stumble. Say that again. If you do these things, you will never stumble. And it says in 2 Peter 1.11, you will be given an entrance into heaven that is abundant. I remember studying this uh, some years ago and realizing that Peter was using a nautical uh, phrase here. He's given an illustration from the world of boats, from the nautical world. He says, if you will live your life with diligence, when it comes time for you to go to heaven, you will enter into the everlasting kingdom in an abundance. Now, let me see if I can get that through to us before we close our Bibles today. This is actually this picture, that heaven has a harbor, and as we sail Godward toward that harbor, moving through the storms and the rocks that lurk in the waves, some ships barely make it into the port. Some ships get to heaven, the crew's exhausted, there's almost mutiny, the rigging's torn, supplies are low, the ship has sprung leaks. It's not exactly like a hail the conquering hero uh, entrance into heaven. But Peter says you don't want to go to heaven that way, and you don't have to go to heaven that way. Peter is telling us that diligent believers are like diligent captains and sailors. They sail with discipline, manning the watchtower, maintaining the ship, keeping the morale high among the crew. It's a picture of the well-lived Christian life. The storms will come, but God has given us what we need to come through all of them all the stronger. In other words, it isn't about just going to heaven. If you have trusted Jesus Christ, your name is on the crew list by order of the captain. What is at issue is the quality of your journey. Think about the sailors of old and the life they led on the sea, the confinement of a small ship and the dangers of storm and stone and shipwreck and the hard life of the open sea required absolute discipline, unquestioned diligence, and particularly an unquestioning obedience to the captain, no matter how desperate the voyage became. So I want to ask you today, how strong is your faith? Are you disciplined and diligent enough to weather the storm? Let me encourage you with these words. As we see the world around us disintegrating, there has never been a time for us to take up the call to diligence that we have been given in the Word of God, to live our lives for Christ with strenuous activity and lavish involvement and self-control.